ask you to open your Bibles in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, and uh, read the passage of scripture here, ask the Lord's blessing on the preaching of his word, Romans chapter 8, verses 9 through 13. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Let's pray. Lord, I ask this morning that you will open minds, illumine our hearts, that your Spirit will have free course over all that is said and done. Pray that our hearts will be set on Christ this morning as we look at this text, as we begin to understand what it means that for those who know Christ to be set free from condemnation, for those who know Christ to no longer be under the dominion of flesh, under the rule of sin that leads to death, but Lord, to be under the reign of grace, under the reign of Christ, and to be in the Spirit, to be led under the authority of the Spirit, that we might live in the very new way of the Spirit. And Father, we ask that you'll work in hearts to give understanding of your word. We ask for those that are here without Christ that today would be a day of salvation, a day you'd open their eyes and their hearts to the gospel, that you might grant them the gifts of faith and repentance, draw them to yourself, that they might be gloriously redeemed, that they might come to know Christ. And Lord, for those, each one who knows Christ, we pray today that you'll speak and minister to our hearts, minister comfort. In this exhortation, Lord, call us to a place of obedient faith, to the humility of faith. May we live out faith, that you might be exalted and glorified. We pray that we will indeed uh, be encouraged by this text this morning in our battle against sin. And we ask it in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. So come to the end of, book of, of chapter 7, and we wrestled through chapter 7 and comes to the end, and Paul highlights for us the, the one source of deliverance in the battle against sin. He talks all in Romans 7 about that struggle that, that we're all too familiar with. In fact, I would suggest to you, if you're not familiar with the struggle against sin, that's because you're just living in it. If you're trying to live out a life of faith, you're going to struggle against sin. And in the midst of that struggle, Paul points us to the only source of deliverance, which is found in relationship. In fact, Paul would say that you're not going to be delivered by a great set of rules. No law is going to deliver you from the power of sin because we have the greatest law of all in our hands. God has given us his word, which is law and has authority, and he's not dismissing the authority of the word of God. He's just saying rules can't change your heart. Rules only expose your heart. And what you need is not to get rid of rules, but what you need is a heart transformation that only comes from Christ. And so he highlights this, this role of which only Christ can deliver. And so there's a relationship that delivers us from the bondage of sin. And so victory in sin is found in relationship, in not knowing about Christ, but honestly knowing Christ. And having our hearts further understand and grow in our apprehension of his worth, of his beauty, of his, excellence, of his excellency. So that we are supremely satisfied with Christ. So that knowing Christ becomes really the treasure of the heart. That our hearts are weaned from the trinkets of this world and from the allurements that the world offers and our flesh often chases after. That the ultimate solution to your battle against sin is to treasure Christ. But the lie of sin is always the same. It is an offer of pleasure outside of obedience to God. And the devil has lied from the beginning to suggest that you can call right and wrong by your decision. You can decide for yourself what's best for you. You can pursue it. And when you pursue it, you're going to find your greatest happiness. And the Bible comes to us and says, no, you were not created for that. You were created for God and by God. And you will only find the satisfaction for your heart in relationship to God. 
And when you learn to treasure what God treasures, it will wean your heart from sin. And so the solution in that battle points us back to this relationship with Christ. And Paul points us to the, the, the means of God's deliverance and that means being found in the ministry of the Spirit and that the, the Spirit of life, the law, the Spirit of life, the law of the Spirit of life sets us free in Christ from the law of sin and death. And so this Spirit's ministry uh, that has brought about, brought us to spiritual life, has brought us under the realm of a whole new authority, which is under the authority of God and no longer under the, under the bondage of sin. And in salvation, Paul is pointing throughout this chapter to this amazing reality that when God saves, he comes to dwell. That God comes to dwell with us. In fact, I would argue that's God's very purpose in all of creation, and it will be consummated in eternity. God intended to create humanity, the only part of creation in his image, the only part of creation that can rightly reflect God, the only part of creation that can enjoy a relationship with God. All of creation points to the glory of God. All of creation is a reflection of his handiwork. But only humanity can enter into a personal relationship with the living God whereby we can not just know about him, we can know him and enjoy him not just now but forever God came to dwell and he sent the spirit, his spirit to dwell within us so that we become new creatures, new creation. We become brand new, we're born again, we're made new, we come to spiritual life and as a result we live in the new way. We live a new life because the Spirit comes to dwell. And all of this helps us understand how incredible it is that God would grant us His Spirit. And then throughout the chapter, we learn what it looks like when we live according to the Spirit rather than according to the flesh. So we started here, and I'm not going to rehash, but I would like to suggest to you and maybe even illustrate for a moment, Romans chapter 8 is a great chapter to memorize. If you want to memorize the whole chapter, I'd highly commend it. But here, let me give you a, ta- give you a, a spiritual assignment. Let me ask you to consider just the first three verses of Romans chapter 8 as something that you would memorize, but not just to memorize, but actually meditate on. Let these three verses saturate your thinking this week so you think about Christ. So there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, right? No condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And so you you should set your heart here on the reality of Christ. And what does it mean that there's, I mean, if I'm not in Christ, I'm condemned. I mean, there's a deliverer and that's Christ. There's deliverance needed and all of us need it that we stood condemned because of the guilt of sin. In fact, he goes right after that saying, for the law of the Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. And so I was under the dominion of sin and death and God had to rescue me from that. And in, through salvation and coming to Christ, I was rescued from the dominion of sin and death, brought to Christ in relationship by means of the Spirit. And so my heart needs to be set on Christ. And, and, and he goes right into verse three. He said, for God has done, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So the law could not bring you into a right relationship with God. It could not free you from the bondage of your sin. It is not the answer to to your struggle. Christ is. And so we're to focus our attention and meditate on the reality of Christ and consider this Christ The the one who is God's true king, the only son, his very son who left heaven's glory. And he dwelled on this sin-cursed earth and he went to a cross to bear the penalty of my sin. To rescue me from dominion of sin so I would not have to live there to be my God and I would be his child. And this God who has all authority in heaven and earth came and dwelled and he knows what it is to live in a sin-cursed world. He knows our state. He knows the struggles that you face. He knows it all. He lived here without sin. 
So throughout your week, you go back to this text and you set your heart on Christ. And you remember this, that in salvation, if you're a child of God, God delivered you from a dominion. You were once enslaved to sin and could not rescue yourself. And Christ rescued you. That you can now live a new life. By means of the very Spirit of God, he came to dwell with you. It's an amazing thing that the God of heaven would dwell with sinners like us. And that he would set us, deliver us from the condemnation that our sin so justly deserves. And so knowing Christ brings this deliverance from the condemnation that we deserve, but not only that, it produces a new way of living a life being lived under the accordance or under the, the ministry, the authority, if you put it that way, of the Spirit. Our focus this morning then comes into verses 8 through 13. We we'll begin in verses 8 and 9. And we see knowing Christ is the means to victory over sin and over death. I read the text. You cannot help but be struck by the conditional sentences there. The conditional if, 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 you know, if the Spirit dwells in you, see in verse 9, if Christ is in you in verse 10, if the Spirit dwells in you again in verse 11. And so each of these sentences sets forth this, this simple, tr- if this is true, then this, these promises apply to you. If this is true, these promises apply to you. And you could take it that Paul was wondering about the salvation of the people in Rome. You could take it that way. Most don't, and I wouldn't take it that way, but Paul does use, and some would say, well, you can translate that if, you could translate it since, since you are in Christ, since the Spirit dwells there, then this. But I I think that would be a wrong way to translate it. Because what Paul is, is simply setting forth, he's never been to Rome, he's heard the reports of their faith, he accepts that testimony of faith, but here's something Paul's ran into in his ministry, something we face this reality too, and it's just this. A profession of faith does not make you a Christian. The fact you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. The fact you say, I'm a Christian, does not equal the reality of the statement. There are many, many people, especially in America today, that will say they're a Christian. That that profession does not mean reality. And Paul understands that. He's writing to a church in Rome. And he's not saying, look, I don't believe you're saved. He's simply saying, look... You profess to be saved. From what I hear, I believe that's true. But remember this. If you're saved, then this is true. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, if Christ does not dwell in you, then you're none of his. And if this is true, and I believe it is, that's what Paul's saying, if and I do believe it is, then these promises are also true. And and so he's going to point them to these promises. Those who know Christ, as he describes in here, are in the Spirit. Christ is in them. They belong to the Spirit of Christ. And this language then paints forth some powerful pictures. That it paints forth the picture that being being a child of God means that Jesus Christ himself has come into and taken control of the life. That that he has come, he is in you, the text would say. Paul would say to Colossians, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That, That where Christ, when Christ saves, he claims the sinner to be his very own. So the language then speaks also of ownership. And then he speaks of us being not only this Christ in us, the spirit in us, but us being in the spirit. And there's the imagery then of the fact there's a transference of realm, that I used to be under one authority, I brought under another authority. That before salvation, I lived under the authority of sin. I lived in this world as a sinner who carried out sin. Even though, I mean, the, the, most people in America who don't know the Lord or profess to do and don't, they live under the dominion of sin. What do I mean by that? I mean, they sin every day. They carry out the sinful desires of their heart. They buy into the lies of this world. They follow after the treasures of society. says, hey, this is going to make you happy. So they chase it. Hey, this is going to make you happy. That, they chase it. They chase after the temporal things, always looking for something else, and they're governed and ruled by sin, and they can't escape it, even though in their own mind they think they're doing their own thing. They are convinced, I made my decision, and this is what I value, so I'm going to chase it. But the reality is, is they are under the dominion of sin, and they can't stop. 
oh, every now and then they've got one, sin, one, one thing that's mastered them and they, they go to another, you know, maybe a 10-step program or something else that's going to help them and, and maybe they can stop drinking or they stop smoking or they stop one thing, but you know what they can't escape? The mastery that sin has in their life. They'll go from one thing to another thing to another thing. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you have been there. Maybe you are there today. And they're constantly being ruled. Well, this whole picture of being in the spirit is saying, look, you were this. I mean, this was my life before God saved me as a junior in college. My life was dominated by sin and carrying out sinful desires and being deceived by the world around me as to what I ought to treasure and what I ought to value and putting my values there and chasing them like it could bring me pleasure. But the day God saved me brought me into a new realm, into the realm of the spirit. You know what that means? It's now I'm under the authority of God and I am being ruled by God himself, no longer by sin. And now that's really good news, because I'm a lawbreaker. And as a lawbreaker who can't escape lawbreaking, that law, that breaking of the law, also means it brings penalty. And I can't escape that either. I need to be brought under a whole new other authority that can deal with my lawbreaking heart and deal with the penalty that comes from being a lawbreaker. And that's exactly what the Spirit does. He delivers from the penalty that my lawbreaking deserves because he takes and brings me to Christ and Christ is the one who gave his life on the cross of Calvary paying for that sin debt and he takes Christ's payment and he applies it to my account and he takes Christ's righteousness and he applies it to my account and he gives me a whole new heart and disposition because he comes to live with me and reign there and now I have not only a deliverance from penalty but I also have a deliverance from the passions of sin that once ruled my life. And so the picture is powerful and the reality then brings to this that if we know Christ as Lord, then we are no longer controlled by sin. Folks, that's good news. That's incredibly good news. You do not have to live under the dominion of sin. You do not have to carry out the prompting of your flesh. You do not, you're not trapped by whatever sin you're struggling with today. I mean, we, if we did the, you know, did the poll today and ask everybody, which, what, what are you struggling with? Some of you would be deceitful in your own heart and say, nothing, everything's great. Some of you would be honest enough to say, well, you know, I'm struggling with this. And I have, and maybe you have for a long time. Maybe that struggle's been so long that you begin to believe that you're not going to be delivered, that you can't be. Good news of the gospel is there's no such thing as a sin that's stronger than Christ. We often look for deliverance in the wrong thing. We look for deliverance in all kinds of things other than where it is actually found. It is found in this relationship with Christ. It is found, and we'll talk about it a little bit more in the text uh, as we, we flesh it out. But Paul wants to remind us that as we've come to Christ, there's, there's been this, this rescue, the rescue from the dominion of sin. We're no longer in the flesh, no longer under the control, the reign of sin, and, and, and we're, we're no longer enslaved there. That's, that's no longer true. As a result of God dwelling with us, we no longer have to live controlled by sin. Because we are in the Spirit, the Spirit opens. In fact, as a result of the Spirit coming to take up residency in us, the Spirit opens our eyes to see sin for what it really is, which is the essence of confession. In 1 John 1, 9, most of you know, all right? If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. I mean, it's a familiar verse. We have a prayer of confession, which we've made a part of our worship service, and really trying to reflect this reality. Listen, all week long, you and I struggle to live by faith, and when I don't live by faith, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And so in every moment and every decision I made all week long that was not an issue of faith, meaning knowing that it pleases God and God approved of it, I sinned. And there's not one of us in this room this week that did not sin. No one. We don't live our life controlled by faith every day. We live our life trying to live out faith, but oftentimes we fail, we struggle, we go back to flesh, we, we bank on what we know rather than what, what we should know, and we fail to live by faith, and in so doing we sin. But yet we, we don't get to the place of confession very easily because every time we sin, we offer ourselves justification for it because you've got to live with you, Right? 
You got to live with the people around you. And so it's oftentimes it's the person next to you's fault that you did it. So we blame shift. Or it's that other person that did it. Or it was my circumstance. And, and we constantly move away from just honest confession. And we, we blame a lot of things. It's my genetics. It's my history. It's my family background. It's the current culture I live in. It's this. It's that. And we go all around. But here's where the Bible brings us back to say, look, we need to come to the place of honest confession, which simply means to agree with God about our sin. Well, how does that happen? By the Spirit of God taking the Word of God in the mirror of God's word, showing us our hearts. That's what James tells us. God will show us our hearts from the word. He'll help us to see our sin for what it is. So the mirror of the word will help us to see, and then it sees that, you know, we got the mustard stain down the tie. Let's change ties. We've got the stain of sin in our life. Let's deal with it. Confess it. And ask God to cleanse and to change. And and this is exactly what the Spirit of God does. He opens our eyes to see sin. He opens our eyes not only to see sin, but he opens our eyes to behold more of God. Because where the Spirit of God comes to dwell, he comes to reign. And that's good news because where God himself reigns, he not only rules, he provides and he comforts and he directs and he loves I mean, I, I, we should be so thankful, so incredibly amazed that the God of heaven doesn't just offer, doesn't give you a series of, hey, you go do this good thing, and you go do this good thing, and if you do enough of them, maybe you'll earn my favor, and maybe I'll let you into heaven. He doesn't do that. He doesn't pass out the series of go do something heroic. He comes to us and says, look, you're sinners, hopelessly enslaved to sin, and you're guilty, but my son paid the penalty on the cross of Calvary because I love you, I created you for me, and I want you to know me and enjoy me forever, but you're guilty and you're tainted and you're stained by sin, and only I can deliver you from that, and it's only through faith in my son. So come. Come to Christ, and when you come, he comes to dwell with you. Not just rule over you from heaven and give some orders. He comes to dwell with you and to transform you and to provide for you and to comfort you and to be your guide and to be the one who is always with you, who will never forsake you, who rescues you from being under the dominion of sin so you no longer have to live there. You know, we we tend to have this idea, and it's kind of an American concept. Maybe it's not just American, just kind of a fallen concept. You know, the more rules somebody has in my life, the more you interfere with what I really want to do. You know, I I just want to be able to decide for myself if that's right or that's wrong. You know what? That's such folly because your heart's so deceitful and so deceived by sin that if you decide for yourself, you know what you're going to do all the time? You're going to do stupid. You're going to just do the foolish thing that you just somehow, because marketing, because so-and-so said this was good, because that's kind of what I like. We would be left to our own folly. Haven't you had enough of that? Haven't your life been marked by enough of your own foolish decisions? I mean, think about it. I mean, I'm not, I, no, I just turned 50, right? Good time to reflect and stop. I know, Pastor, you're having a midlife crisis. I'm already past midlife, right? Yeah, I mean, you go there. I mean, in life, you look back, and I can look back in my life, and I can see some of the, just the foolish decisions I made at times where I thought, oh, I'm just right. I'm going to do it. This is right. And and you make foolish choices and it marks and it affects your life. It affects relationships and it has long lasting effect. I mean, have you had not had enough of your own way? The good news of the gospel is you don't have to live there. You don't have to live there. The default of your heart, because of sin, the default of our heart is to do our own thing. The good news of the spirit coming to reign is that when we walk under the authority, set ourselves and live in submission to the Spirit, He will rule, He will direct, He will guide, He will comfort. And we don't have to live in sin any longer. I love the language as Paul talks about the Spirit of God dwelling in you. It's a good text tying over to even what we talked about Wednesday night in our prayer text in Ephesians chapter 3 and Wednesday. And I encourage you to come out. We're learning to pray together through the Scriptures. 
In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul writes here in verse 16 that according to the riches of his glory, this is part of his prayer, he's praying according to the riches of God's glory, here's my prayer request, that God may strengthen you with power, look by the means, through his spirit. Why? Because the spirit dwells in you. So where is the spirit going to strengthen you? In your inner being. And what is the purpose of praying for the spirit to, to strengthen your inner man, your inner being, so that Christ would dwell in your hearts through faith? And so Paul says here in Romans 8, look, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And he's talking here in, in Ephesians as he's praying. He said he's praying, I pray to God that the Spirit will work powerfully in your life so that Christ would dwell there. And all of it points to this language of dwelling as this settled place of residency. That God would be at home in your life. That your life looks like a place that Jesus Christ lives. Isn't that what we want the world to know about us? I mean, I know we, you know, we take all kinds of identities, whether you're a student, father, worker, retire. I mean, we take all kinds of identities, and, and people come up and ask you your name, and your, your name is part of your identity, where you're from, that's part of your identity, and, and we've got a few rare birds in here that are actually from Florida. You know, we're from all over the place, and we come here, and, and we gather together, and where are you from? And, and then it's usually, what did you do, or what are you doing? Where do you work? Because those are all your identity, and, and I do this, and I do this, and, and we want people to think certain things about us, whether we want people to know we're a good parent, or whether we're a good worker, or whether we play a sport well. We want them to know all kinds of things, but here's fundamentally who you ought to identify yourself as and what you ought to want people to know. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, if you know Christ as Lord, then you should want people to know that you know Christ. That your life is ruled by Christ. And that the one person that you want to approve of your life and your decisions is Christ. That's how you break free from all the peer pressure around you. And peer pressure is just not a teenage thing, just not a kid thing. We live in it in everyday reality of the places you work and the places you go and the expectation of a culture around you. We live with all of these things and we define our life by all kinds of things that have nothing to do with pleasing Christ. And the good news of the gospel is God rescued you from living that way. Doesn't mean you can't bow your heart back there and start trying to live that way again. But you do not have to live that way any longer the spirit of God has come to make you a fitting habitation for God himself that's why I know this I know gospel I know that when God saves a sinner he begins a work of transformation that people who get saved cannot remain in a life of sin not going to say they can't struggle with sin but where the spirit of God comes he transforms He makes new. And he begins that process of weaning our hearts away from sin so that God will actually be at home in our life. We could go through today and just illustrate in a number of ways, but I could walk through and different ones, you bought a house or you move into a new place. When Ethan and Sarah bought their, got their apartment, their apartment let them paint, which was unusual. So you know what mom and dad got to do? We got to go up and help them paint, paint their whole apartment. And it was all part of them making it home. So they put their, you know, they put furniture in and they began to get their pictures on the wall. But everything began with just let's make this apartment home. It becomes our home. And if you've been through buying a house or all of that, or you go through that process of making it home. So when you come home, it's comfortable. It fits you. It reflects you. Now, some of you are going, oh, don't come over because I don't want you to see the picture of my house. Anyway, it all reflects in some way. But my life is to be a reflection of Christ. Isn't that what it means to be Christ-like? And, and left to myself, I'm a horrible reflection of Christ. But the good news is God didn't leave me to myself. The Spirit of God came to dwell, and where he came to dwell, he came to reign. And where he came to reign, he came to transform. So I no longer, you no longer have to be ruled by sin. And the end of verse 9, he gives a simple reality check. And the end of verse 9 is just simply, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. 
And he gives us a reminder in there of ownership that when I come to Christ, I'm now owned. I've been bought with a price. I belong to Christ. I'm now to live like I belong to him. That's what my life is to look like. I belong to Christ. That's Christianity 101. I mean, I know it's not a popular model of Christianity today. The popular model of Christianity is profess to believe in Jesus and live life for you. You know, look at all the benefits God's going to do you. In fact, I hear that language all the time. Just focus on what God has done for you. Well, here's what you focus on. What has God done for you? He rescued you from sin. Why? So that you might live a new life that reflects his glory, not that you're going to live a life that reflects your preferences. God did not rescue you from a penalty of sin so you could go about and live for yourself. He did not do that. That's not the gospel. God saves us from a life lived unto ourself that would be our destruction. And he comes to dwell with us so we might live a life that reflects that we belong to Christ. And so that's just a thought-provoking question and a thought-provoking application for all of us today. Do the people that know you best, would they say you belong to Christ? Do they even know that you belong to Christ? Does your life communicate to them that you belong to Christ? That's what it means. That's what we're called to be. And that's what the gospel enables us to do, to no longer live controlled by sin. But not only no longer live controlled by sin, but here's a very important reality. No longer to fear death. Because you see, as I engage in a life for the gospel, I'm going to face the opposition of a world that hates God. It's becoming increasingly so in our country, isn't it? You stand up for what's right and you're going to be an object of ridicule. Just pick a moral topic of our day and speak on it, what the Bible has to say, and you're going to be called a religious zealot, a hate monger. You're going to be, I mean, your job could be on the line. They might not rent to you. I mean, there's all kinds of punitive things that are happening in our culture for standing for the gospel. Well, here's a reality. If you think you need the approval of people around you or that you can't endure suffering, you're going to compromise truth for the sake of the acceptance of men because you're afraid. Here's the good news of the gospel. It frees me from fear. The gospel frees me from fear. Here's some, you know, God has not given, Paul had to tell Timothy this. If you struggle with fear, I'm not just kind of beating you down, all right? Paul had to tell Timothy, Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of strong mind, of self-control. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. Here's one of the things I know. When I get afraid to stand up, so when you're afraid to speak the gospel or hand out the track or share the gospel with somebody else and you're afraid to do that, you know what that is? It's sin because it's not faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. When fear shows up in my life and it keeps me from obeying God and doing what I know God's told me to do, I'm sinning. I'm just, I don't believe God. I don't trust God. Well, here's what what the gospel is meant to rescue us from living that way so that we might live courageously for Christ. But you look at verse 8 and 10. I mean, he said, if Christ is in you, and just reminder, hey, Christ is in you. If that's true, then guess what? The body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life life because of righteousness. That's kind of a confusing verse. And a lot of been ink spilled on it. But what is he saying? I think the simple explanation, the body is dead because of sin. All right, your physical body, guess what? Is going to die. Why? Because we're all sinners. And because sin entered the world, death entered the world. And because I'm a sinner, I'm still going to face death. Now that, just say, that's not very good news. You're right. Your physical body's dying. And one day it's going to fail you completely, and you're going to die physically. But if Christ is in you, it's not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story for anyone. It brings us into eternity, either eternal death or eternal life. But if Christ is in you, then guess what? The spirit is life because of righteousness, not yours, Christ's. And the day I trusted Christ as Savior, that day in a, as a junior in college, and I got on my knees in a college auditorium, and I confessed my sin, and I asked Christ to save me. In that day, God clothed me in the righteousness of his own son. Justification by faith not by works i will never stand before god no one in this room will ever stand before god and be accepted based on your righteousness 
The Spirit brings life because he is the Spirit of life. He is God himself. And where the Spirit of God comes to dwell, guess what cannot be killed? God cannot be killed. The life that he brings cannot be destroyed even by physical death. Isn't that amazing? You know what? We've not faced it in America, the kind of persecution, generally speaking. They're more sporadically occurred, but I mean a widespread, governmental organized, sweeping persecution against believers that cost lives is not a rare thing in this world. It has been a part of the history of this world since, Christ, since God began saving sinners. That other sinners not saved kill the people of God. It's been a part of human history and we have not faced it in this country like that, but there are brothers and sisters of ours all around the world who face that reality every day, that today the government may evade our church, they may shoot, may take people to jail, some of us will die this year, the people I'm worshiping next to this year will not be the same next year because some of them are gonna die. How do they live in that culture? By faith that frees you from the fear of death because you know what? The only, I mean, you know, we get afraid that they're gonna take my job away from me. We're afraid they're gonna take some comfort away from me. We're afraid people will reject us. I mean, they won't like us. If we hand them that gospel track, they'll get mad at us. I mean, we get afraid for the simplest and the most foolish things to not trust God. I mean, put your life on the line. And God is saying, you can trust me with your life. I have that. It's mine. I bought it. Now trust me with your life. Because if you will not trust me with your eternity, you will not trust me in your daily decisions either. And if you do trust me with your eternity, then trust me now in your daily decisions because that reveals that you really trust me with your eternal life. I, I, maybe I didn't make that all clear, but I mean a lot of people tell me they're Christians, but they don't trust God enough to obey him in the simplest things of life. And I say, are you telling me you're a Christian and that you've trusted that Jesus Christ paid for your, your sin, he died, he rose again, and you put your faith, so you're trusting that when you physically die, you're gonna be in the presence of God and not in hell? Yes, okay, then why don't you trust him with this decision? Well, I, uh, I uh, and here's the reality. If you really trust Christ with your eternity, you're gonna trust Christ now. If you will not trust Christ now, then you really have to ask yourself, have you ever trusted Christ at all? Because we're, when we trust Christ, the Spirit of God comes to dwell. And the Spirit of God ministers confidence in the Word of God, in the person of God, so that we continually learn to trust. Now, that doesn't mean I don't bail out at times and I go back to my flesh and I struggle at times to trust. I do. But the direction of my life because of the Spirit's presence is to grow in my trust and dependence on God. Being freed from the fear of death itself so that I might serve Christ in ways that make him known. And so Paul's ministering this assurance of what the Spirit's ministry accomplishes because here's, here's you go in verse 11, is the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. I mean, he's just pointing to the resurrection of Christ and he's saying, do you understand that when God saved you, he came to dwell with you, the very power that Christ's life could not, I mean, he gave his life on the cross of Calvary and he rose in victory over death and sin and that same power now dwells in you? You're not subject to sin. You're not its victim. You're indwelled by the very spirit of God who raised Christ from the dead. He dwells in you. And he rose Christ from the dead and that, that same power, that mortal body, this body that's gonna fail, my mortality is overcome by God himself so that this mortality will be swallowed up in immortality because the spirit of God dwells here. 
Folks, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, you don't need to fear death. And we need to serve God in ways that show we are not afraid. Not afraid to stand for Christ. We're to serve God in a courageously, in a fallen world, willing to spend and be spent on our physical frames for the sake of the gospel. The life that God has given to you cannot be destroyed by men. Men cannot take away what God has given to his children. You do not need to fear. You've been called into battle and to the battle by the king of glory himself to go engage in a world that's hostile to him. Stop trying to make this world your home or your friend. It is neither. You have a better dwelling place. You have a better city. You have a friend who is closer than a brother. You have the God of heaven who dwells with you. You do not need the acceptance of men. You do not need their approval. You do not need their stuff. You have the God of heaven who is always with you and he gives you the courage to serve so that others will see what it really means to be in Christ to be in Christ and under Christ. So that we find that knowing Christ brings us in this daily battle against sin. That it it actually engages us in such a way that we can daily engage in putting sin to death that we might live for Christ. So Paul writes, we're no longer debtors to the flesh we are no, I'm sorry, so then brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, but if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if you live by the spirit, if, if, you, if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And he just rolls into this, look, this life-giving spirit has come to dwell in you. So now you, you have the spirit and having the spirit brings a divine obligation, doesn't it? I mean, it's similar language here, right? In Colossians chapter 2, 6. Therefore, if you've received, as you received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk, so live. Live like he's your what? Lord. You came to Christ in faith. You know Christ is Lord, so live it. Live like he's Lord. Not just over the world. Your life. And that's what Paul's saying. He uses this this language of debt, of obligation to say, look, when God saves, he brings you into a whole new realm and relationship that then brings responsibility with it. And you and I are called on to live out the reality of a life that has been given in faith, that is then to be lived in faith, that shows to a world that Christ is Lord. And all of that will redound to the glory of God. It is a privilege to belong to Christ, and with that comes the responsibility. We're bought with a price, right? Bought with a price, therefore glorify, honor. Make God's glory known through your life. You're bought with a price. Don't be a servant of men. You you don't belong to them. You belong to Christ. Whoa, really? It's the end, okay, all right. In this battle against sin, as you look back, and I'm just going to back up then to go to put verse 13 on there. If we live by the spirit, by the flesh, because we're no longer under the flesh, remember we've been rescued from that. If we live by the flesh, then we're going to die in the full theological sense of that word. Not just physical death, but spiritual death eternal. Because if you're still under the reign of the flesh, if you're still in in flesh being used and really in reference to everything that was a part of my fallen nature, not only what's inside of me, but the fact that what was in, that, that my the fall affected me personally, and that I that my sin sin dominated. But I live in a fallen world that values the wrong things, and so this world, you know, we're not supposed to be a friend of the world. Whoever's going to make themselves a friend of the world's the enemy of God. When you think of flesh, you got to think of something that's bigger than you. It's a part of the whole fallen system in rebellion against God. So the world's way, the devil's way, the prince of power, the air, all of that that is leading in rebellion against God, you were, you're not that anymore. That's not where you live anymore. 
You've been rescued from that dominion. You're not that. You're not flesh. You're now in the spirits. And now if you live that way as one dominated by the temporal things of this world and live for your own personal pleasure, you're going to die. Not just physically, but forever. But by the spirit, we then put to death those old things that once dominated our life. We put them to death. Well, how do we do that? And the answer is this, by faith. You see, faith, is, the faith begins when we come to the place where we look to the cross of Calvary. And when we look to the cross of Calvary, we begin to understand the gospel. And, and, and the cross is necessary because you and I cannot save ourselves. You see, if we were, you just need a little help, Jesus didn't need to die. He would just need to come, maybe give us a good example. But the fact of the matter is, my guilt is so overwhelming that a debt had to be paid and only a cross could do it. And only the very Son of God could pay that debt of sin. Only the very Son of God could live that life of righteousness. And, and faith begins when I trust Christ. I turn from sin and submit my heart and trust Christ. But see, then the life of faith, so often, here's what we get wrong in the Christian life. And this is what Paul wants to get right. We think a life of faith is I just look back to the cross and say, oh yeah, I trusted Jesus. But it begins with trusting Jesus. Then the life of faith looks to the promises of God. And the promises of God include that the Spirit of God came to dwell in me to set me free from sin. Isn't that a great promise? It means this week, as you go to live your life in this fallen world and the temptations of sin are bombarding all around you, and your heart is being lured and you're tempted to respond in ways that you know would not reflect Christ, you don't have to obey that. You don't have to bow and say yes to sin anymore. Something better dwells in you. The Spirit of God will take the Word of God, right? How do we do battle against sin? We do it by the Spirit. Well, well you know something about spiritual armor, right? We're supposed to pick up the what of the Spirit? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we're supposed to kill sin. It's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to take the Word, and that means I come in prayer to God and say, God, bring me to your understanding of your Word so I see sin in my life for what it is. I behold you for who you are. Help me to hate sin like you hate it. And may the Spirit of God take the Word of God and carve sin out of this sinner's heart. Because faith is not about just looking back. It's looking forward. It's not just about prefer to say, well, I want to do right. It's preferring righteousness. It's desiring the right thing. It is about having the affections of God rule in my heart. Faith sees Christ, and it wants more of Christ. I, you ought to want... And I'll leave you with this thought. And as we go into the Lord's table, maybe we can meditate on this. We're going to take the Lord's table today, which we're to do in remembrance of Christ. And let me just say this. Unless you know Christ as your Savior, you've got nothing to remember. Unless you've honestly come to Christ as Savior, then you have no part of the table. And as I do it in remembrance of Christ, I'm remembering a text like this. I'm remembering all that it means that Jesus, what no, could be done no other way God did in sending his son. And his son was sent for sin to deal with it once and forever. And he condemned sin himself by living that life of righteousness and going to a cross of Calvary. And that in the day that I repented of my sin, I saw myself as a sinner and I turned and I trusted Christ, that he rescued me from the dominion of sin and made me his very own made me his own and now he's come to dwell with me so that I might love and serve him in a ways that honors him that I would prefer Christ I mean you if, if you've experienced salvation there was a day your eyes were opened and you said you know what you said I want Christ I don't want sin if that never happened friend you never got saved I mean you may have somebody may have said pray this prayer with me in Sunday school you're going to go to heaven then that's not true 
Salvation involves the opening of spiritually blinded eyes to see and behold Christ, to prefer Christ over sin. If that never happened in your life, then you need to be saved. If somebody just pressed you one time when you were little and you were five or six or ten or whatever it was and somebody said, here, you need to pray this prayer with me and you need to go to the baptismal tank so you can go to heaven. You'll find that nowhere in the Bible. That was not salvation. Salvation involves an honest understanding and an apprehension that is brought by the Spirit of God so that we see our sin for what it is and we turn from it and we trust Christ because we prefer Christ. Faith then demands a life lived that way. That I constantly am looking to Christ and the more I behold of Christ, the more I want. You see, if you want just as little of Christ as you can possibly get in your life, then do you love him? Is he really Lord or is he just the tack on that you hope gets you to heaven? Because if Christ has come to reign in your heart, he's Lord. And that should be good news for you. That should be what you desire more than anything else. And so as we take of the Lord's table, we're saying, Lord, you know, there's things in my life I'm sure aren't pleasing to you. There's things in my life that don't reflect you to the world around me. Help me to see them. And Lord, not just see them, help me to, to, to hate them like you do. Help me to see you and, and help me to learn to live in a way that reflects you to a world lost in darkness. Lord, Lord, help that to happen. And because your spirit dwells in me, I have hope that that will happen. As I go to the word and go to prayer, and folks, word and prayer, it, it's not just the spiritual exercise to get up and spend five minutes on word and then pray. It's not just thank you, Lord, for the day and thank you, Lord, for, the, for food. I'm coming to a throne filled with grace because I need help. Because I don't have the ability to live for God on my own and I, can't, I, I don't discern the world well on my own. I need help. And when I'm convinced I need help and God's the one that can help me, then I pray. When I'm convinced that I need truth and, and I know God's word is truth, then I read. And I read because I want to know more of God and I want to understand how to please God and I want to know how to live in, in a way that, that pleases God in this world. And so I, I'm in the word and I want the word in me and I know the spirit of God works through that word to open my mind and give me understanding and help me to live it out. And so I want more of that, not less. And as we take of the Lord's table, I hope we're taking of it and we're reflecting and praising God for what he did on a cross, but also what he's doing right now. Because he dwells with us. He dwells in us. He has made us his very own. And by God's grace, we want to live like we belong to Christ. You know, at the end of my life, whatever you remember about me, whatever anybody remembers about me, the one thing I would that would stand out, and I'm sure it probably doesn't, but that I knew Christ. One thing that matters. At the end of the day, when they throw dirt on this body, the one thing that matters is that people know that I knew Christ and I loved Christ. And that'll affect everything else, how I love my wife, how I love my family, how I serve a world, 